Okay, so this is my keynote on the Industrial Revolution. Now, most of these slides we looked at today in class on uh, Wednesday, November 29th, but I wanted to upload this so that you could review it. It is a lot of information, and after reading Palmer, it might help to go through this and to kind of make sense of what you read. Uh, also, and just to kind of uh, review some, some points about why England led in the Industrial Revolution. Um, I basically think four reasons. If you look at the top of the slide, it says metals, woolens, and canals. And basically, that says it all. England had abundant resources. Coal deposits, iron deposits, copper deposits, okay? Um, this is natural to the geography and layout of England. They had plenty of raw materials, like wool, uh, for their textile industry. Uh, they, because they had a great sheep livestock program. They had an elaborate canal system, which was government-funded, by the way, and a public project. And then finally, and this is very important, they had relative political stability. You know, you didn't have revolutions breaking out in England in the 18th century. You didn't have wars uh, being fought on English soil. And I think when, when people live in a degree of relative peace, they can invest their efforts into uh, industry, right? Okay, so let's go on to the next slide here. Um, basically, what we see happening uh, with the Industrial Revolution is that the typical family goes from being um, the chief producer to the chief consumer. Now, let's go through this. Is that basically um, most essential products were produced at home prior to the late 1700s. In other words, people made everything that they needed at home. Uh, or they inherited it, maybe by parents, right? It was not uncommon to inherit your parents' uh, kitchen utensils, you know, spoons uh, for stirring soup uh, or uh, maybe a pot to cook things in, right? By the 1800s, though, the practice was to purchase from local factories, local merchants who sold spoons and pots and barrels and wagon wheels and all that, okay? So by the 1800s, the typical family was now no longer the top producer. They were the top consumer. Let's talk about what we read about in the notes called the putting out system. The Industrial Revolution is all about how things are made and the rapid changes that happen and how those are made. So let's look at this. The putting out system required very little investment by the merchant. In other words, we're, calling, we're going to call the merchant, we're thinking of him as the businessman, right? The guy who owns the business. So it required very little investment, but it was inefficient in terms of having the work spread out. And so in this chart, you can see that the putting out system might involve five, six, seven steps, right? Um, and so the Industrial Revolution is all about doing production better. And so if you look at the cottage system, if you look at the putting out system, you can probably see that, well, wait a minute, that's not an efficient system. Too many people are doing different jobs or maybe even the same job, but at different locations, okay? So let's go on to our next slide and Adam Smith. If you recall, Adam Smith, um, uh, you remember that his notion of the division of labor, you know, you break a task down into its individual parts and you assign one man to do the one part. Now, in one of his... Um, in one of his most famous uh, publications, Adam Smith used the example of a pin factory. Now, and you're probably thinking, okay, how, you know, how much effort goes into making a pin? Um, but remember that in the late 18th century, making a pin was done by one man by hand. And so in a typical day, a guy might be lucky to, to make a few dozen pins because it was it was a rather... Uh, drawn out, involved process. But if you break it down into each individual step, and you have one guy do the same thing all day long with making a pin. Let's say he you know, puts the head on the pin. That's all he does. From the time he gets to work to the time he leaves, that's all he does is he puts the head of the pin on the pin. That's it. And then another guy makes the pin straight. And another guy sharpens the point. And another guy draws out the wire. And so on and so on. Okay, now the assembly line is basically the, the mechanized version of Smith's division of labor. Now, if you put these workers in one location with all the products and with all the means of production, you have a factory. 
So the factory allows the business owner or the merchant to locate all of the machinery and production means and the workers in one location. So early factories were powered by water and then steam. Now, one of the drawbacks of the factory now, ah, one of the drawbacks of the factory is that it does require a lot of investment capital on the part of the merchant, the owner. Okay, it does require a lot of investment capital. The transition from water power to steam allows factories to move locations beyond water sources. And so steam power allows uh, for constant operation. If you think about this, um, rivers freeze, right, during the winter. And we're talking about England. And so um, if you have your factory powered by steam, you can run it uh, 24-7, essentially. Now, what's going to provide that steam, of course, is the coal mining industry. So if you just look at some of these numbers, I think you can see that from 1800, uh, within the space of a little over 100 years, look at, look at the increase of coal. And I think that tells you about the, um, one of the natures of the Industrial Revolution is its proliferation. Okay? Some names that we associate, of course, um, Richard Arkwright, the pioneer of the factory system, um, you know, uh, in terms of a mechanized system. Adam Smith was the one who came up with the idea of divide the labor, but Arkwright was the one who had mechanized means of production. If you look at this, uh, if, uh, if you look at his uh, invention there, it's called the water frame. And this was a water-powered, uh, now, in terms of water power, a factory would typically have a water wheel attached to it, and the water wheel would be powered, but that water wheel was attached to um, a gear system, which would power uh, like a drive shaft that ran through the factory and could then operate individual machines. Okay, so this is called the uh, the water frame, but it was a mechanized means of producing cloth and textile. Let's go to the next one, the power loom, one of my favorites. Um, now, if you look at this, you can see that. This device requires very little skill to operate. Now think about that. It's because prior to the Industrial Revolution, objects and products were made by skilled craftsmen, okay, who took years to practice. And so their labor cost a lot of money, right? Because you're paying somebody for their skill. But look at this. Anybody could operate this. You don't need to, you don't need to spend years in training or practice. You don't, have to, you don't have to be an artisan to do this. All you have to do is pull a few gears and and it basically operates itself. And that means you can hire unskilled labor at a lower cost. Now think about that. If you're a businessman, that's the way you're going to go, huh? Here's one of another one of my favorites called the spinning frame. Um, and it's kind of a blurry photo, but you can get the idea that it's operated by, it's, it's kind of a clumsy system. Um, but the spinning frame could basically take raw wool. Raw wool means it came right off the sheep, basically. And it could take raw wool and it could spin it into thread. Now, normally, this was done by usually older women. They, that's why they called them spinsters, by the way. Sometimes when we talk about an old, unmarried woman, we call her a spinster. And that's all she's good for is spinning wool into thread. Pretty sad, you know, scenario. But um, the word spinster comes from this idea of, you You know, in order to get thread to make cloth, you had to spin the wool into thread. Well, the spinning frame could do that without one person having to do it all. You, you, you speed it up. You get more product with less effort. And think about that. Again, always look at this from the point of view of like the businessman, the, the, the merchant, the entrepreneur of the time, right? Some factory production concerns. One, uh, factory systems they concentrate the production in one place, okay? Everything's under one roof, and that's good, okay? Um, it has to be located near a source of power. Now, that doesn't have to be water. I mean, with steam, you just want to have it close to, um, uh, you know, maybe like a, a railroad track, someplace where you can get coal, for instance. Uh, now, the big drawback, it requires a lot of capital investment. Here's a photograph of James Watt's steam engine. Um, without James Watt and his development of the steam engine, I don't, I don't know that the Industrial Revolution would have happened as it did. James Watt was a Scottish engineer, an experimenter, kind of a jack-of-all-trades. And Watt did not invent 
the steam engine. But um, uh, Watt improved on the steam engine. And what he did was this. He improved on what they called the condenser. And if you know about steam, you know that when steam gets cold, it condenses, right? Well, if you have a steam engine, you need to keep the steam hot all the time. And so uh, James Watt came up with a, a system to keep the steam hot so that it didn't lose, you, you didn't lose that steam volume and the strength of the steam in the, in the engine. Um, so his work was with the, with the condenser. He didn't actually invent the steam engine. The steam tractor, of course, is the next application. If you can take a steam engine, why not put it on a vehicle with four wheels and see if it can move? The steam tractor was uh, not a long-lived technology. Uh, the steam ship, however, uh, Robert Fulton's uh, steamboat, the Claremont, was the first uh, steam-powered uh, uh, riverboat and uh, transformed uh, transatlantic uh, crossings, right? And then, of course, the railroad. And here is uh, the very first uh, steam locomotive. This is, you are looking at the very first steam locomotive called uh, the Rocket. Yes, and um, it's incredibly small for a steam locomotive. Uh, I had the pleasure of actually seeing the original Rocket uh, designed by Townsend. Um, and it's on display at the Henry Ford Museum in Detroit. All steam-powered, but you can see a very, very crude model, very basic, but a, a steam engine nonetheless, right? The first railroad, right? And think about this. The impact of the railroad. Railroads did not just move things. They moved people, okay? And so one of the outcomes of the Industrial Revolution, as we're going to see by Unit 5 in the 1900s, is the, um, or sorry, the 1800s, the 19th century, the 1800s. One of the impacts we're going to see is that the railroad is moving whole populations. It's not just moving, uh, you know, uh, uh, timber or iron or steel or, or uh, coal. Uh, railroads are moving people. And so people are migrating to different parts of Europe. The railroad system really takes off in England. If you look at some of these charts, you see that the time, um, in terms of transportation, you know what it what it what it, what it used to take uh, the, the the amount of time it used to take to travel uh, in an old coach uh, coach and horse uh, system. I mean, the railroad, you know, just radically transformed that. So this is this is my my first slideshow on industrialization, uh, with just some of the high points there about the major industries. Of that, uh, what I wanted to focus on in this, I hope I did, was England's unique role. Everything came together for England in leading uh, this. Again, if you look at you know the whole issue of the railroad, railroads need coal, and England had plenty of that, and still does. So that's my little uh, uh, keynote there on on England's unique role in industrialization.